Okay, it is about that time. If you would, open your Bibles with me back to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to start off our study there in Ephesians chapter 5. We're in week number 3 of our study, Getting to Know Your Bible. And we have started off very, very basic, and we're just going to build and build and build on that foundation uh, as we move along. The goal, of course, is to grow in our relationship with God's Word. We have talked about how it is precious in week number one and how it is profitable in week number two. And we want to begin uh, moving into really the realm of application today uh, in our time together. We're glad that you're here. We'll get into our study in just a moment. Before you, we do, if you will bow with me, let's start off our day together with a word of prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning with thanksgiving and awe and reverence in our hearts. We confess that you alone are holy, that your ways are higher than our ways and, and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And all that we can do, the more that we learn of you, is, is humble ourselves in your sight and express our great need for you. We thank you for powerful declarations of your glory and your might and your majesty in creation. We thank you for the rising of the sun this morning and for the beauty of the seasons that we enjoy, for sustaining all things by the word of your power. We pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear the, the magnificence of creation. And remember that you are, are holding all of these things together, but that you've promised that there is an end to all of these earthly things. We thank you for your clear written revelation to us that tells us who you are, what you are like, your will for our lives, what you would have us to do while we are here and, and where we are going. We pray that each day we would treat this written revelation as more and more precious. We pray that you would help us to invest in it, that it may be profitable to guide us and, and correct us and lead us all the way to you. We thank you for all who have gathered throughout this building to study your great book. We pray that your blessing would be on all of us throughout this day. And it is through Jesus that we offer our prayer. Amen. Okay, week number one, God's Word is precious. Week number two, last week, God's Word is profitable. And today, as we do our best to, to launch into this idea of applying what we're finding in this book, we begin by talking about covenants. Okay, we're going to talk all about that over the course of the next 35 minutes or so. We want to camp out, begin in Ephesians chapter 5. This is the passage of Scripture that we began with last Sunday morning. It's a good reminder as we get back into this study why we're doing it and what God's aim for us in relation to this book is. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we made note in our material that there are just some basic, basic things we can logically draw out of that. There is a Lord over all of humanity, and I am not Him. You are not Him. He is beyond us. He has created us, He has defined us, He has communicated to us. He has a will as the Lord of all humanity for our lives. And that will can be understood. That comes through loud and clear from Ephesians chapter 5, doesn't it? And finally, to live in willful ignorance of that will or to live in willful rebellion against that will, Paul says that is Foolish. There is a God. He has a will. His will can be understood. And to ignore or rebel against that will is 
foolish. And that's what the rest of this workbook is all about. How do I understand what God's will is for my life as it is expressed in this book? And there are few things that are more foundational to all of that than this idea of covenants in the Bible. God is a God of covenants in the Bible. In your own words, what is a covenant? I described it in here as a relationship based on promises. Alex, go ahead. A contract with okay. two sides that need to meet each other's needs. Yeah, that, that is kind of putting it in terms that you and I can understand as modern Americans. It's the idea of a, a contractual relationship. These are my needs and this is what you can do to meet my needs and these are your needs and this is what I can do to meet your needs. And so let's enter into this relationship based on promises and, and see if we can not work together and make some promises. Covenants weren't always uh, having to do inherently with God, okay? There are covenants in the Bible that we read about that just involve different human beings. We, we list a few down toward the bottom of page 16 in your material. We won't take the time to go back and read about it, but in Genesis 31, Laban says to his nephew Jacob, why don't we make a covenant? This is what you can expect from me, and this is what I expect of you. Are you good with that? And Jacob said yes, and so they began to work together. They entered into this relationship based on promises. Or in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read about Jonathan, son of King Saul, and his great love, how his soul was knit to the soul of David and they made a, a covenant with one another. Jonathan with David because in the language of chapter 18 and verse 3 he loved him as his own soul. Lots of covenants in the Bible. Even marriages in the last book of the Old Testament in Malachi. Marriages between a husband and a wife are spoken of in the language of a covenant. And we understand the more that we learn about marriage in the Bible, really it's a three-way covenant, right? Between a man and a woman and God who binds them together, okay? So we understand the basic idea of a covenant. A covenant is a relationship based on promises. This is what you can expect of me, and this is what I expect of you. Are you good with that? Okay, let's now make some progress together. Of course, one of the special things in the Bible is the idea that Almighty God, whose ways are higher than our ways and whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts, He was willing to enter into covenants at different times throughout history with human beings. Let's open our Bibles to the first book of the Bible, all the way back to Genesis chapter 9, or Genesis chapter 6. And again, we don't have time to read the, the full account most of us are familiar with this Old Testament story of Noah. God looks on the earth and he sees that it is exceedingly wicked. But one of the earliest instances that we run across this idea of a covenant is with Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in the midst of this exceedingly wicked generation. And so God approaches Noah. God is the initiator of this. And he says in Genesis 6 verse 17, Behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. A few pages over in Genesis chapter 9, we could read down through verses 18 through 17. Seven times God uses the word covenant, okay? After the flood, after he has wiped everything out, seven different times in those just few verses, he uses the word covenant. And as we look uh, th throughout our time together this morning, we're going to look at, at a basic timeline. We look down 
all the way back in the days of Noah. Here we are on the historical timeline. God comes to Noah in Genesis chapter 9 and says, Noah, I'm making a covenant with you. But it wasn't just with Noah. Who was this covenant with? His sons, his grandsons, his great-grandsons, great-great-great-great. It's with everybody, right? It is a covenant with humanity. And what is God's part of the covenant? What does He say, what does he say humanity can expect from Him? Nancy? Yeah, he will never destroy the world with water. Yeah. Never again will I destroy the world with water. Okay, all of humanity with water. And does he give any sort of a sign of his faithfulness to that covenant? Rainbow. The rainbow in the cloud, right? And so we could trace that from Noah all the way to us. A covenant with all of humanity. I will never again destroy all of the world with water. Now, notice, he does not say, I will never again destroy the world, period. He says, I will never again destroy the world with water. And that is a covenant made with all of humanity. It begins with Noah and all of humanity ever since then, all the way down to us. Now, again, if we had time, we could go back and we could see. We've got it documented on page 18 of the material. You read the first seven verses of Genesis chapter 9. And there are expectations of human beings as well, right? God says, I'm entering into this relationship with you. And this is what you can expect from me. Never again will I destroy the world with water. But I also have expectations of you. Outlined in the first seven verses of Genesis 9. You respect the life that is in blood. And you don't shed each other's blood. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And we move on from there. Okay, A relationship based on promises. Humanity, this is what you can expect from me. This is what I expect from you. And it has to do with the way that you interact with each other. Simple idea of a covenant okay we keep moving in the bible over to genesis chapter 12 a few pages over in your bibles to genesis chapter 12 where we read about another another covenant god again being the initiator it's not that one day this man abram tried to uh, contact god and say god this is what i need from you and and this is what i'll give to you would you enter into this with me god is the the initiator of this okay and the more we learn about the Bible, the more we understand this is all a part of God's great rescue plan to rescue humanity from their sins. In Genesis 12, he comes to Abram and tells him, get up, go to a land that I'll show you. Leave your family, leave your kindred behind. Go to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abram, this is what you can expect from me. From you, I'm going to make a great nation and I'm going to give that nation a land to live in. And through your lineage, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. Right now, get up and go. That's your part of this covenant at this point in time. And Abram does that. We turn a few pages over in Genesis chapter 17. And once again, it's interesting, we've just got a, a handful of verses, but seven times God uses the word covenant this is the covenant that i am making with you and is there a sign once again of that covenant relationship with noah it was a rainbow with abram what was the sign associated with that covenant circumcision, circumcision right now it's a sign that human beings are going to to have of their covenant relationship with god Okay? And as far as we know, let, let's say we, we just pick up God's Word and we begin reading, okay, here's the covenant, and as far as we know, it just keeps, keeps on lasting, right? Don't know any better at this point as we're making our way through 
God's book. But if you know anything about the Bible, of course, you know that um, things weren't always rosy. Things didn't always go well. We read about this man's descendants eventually going down to Egypt. And in the book of Exodus, we find them in slavery and bondage, right? They've been in bondage by the, the time of the Exodus for uh, 400 years, been there for a long time. And so once again, God comes to a man named Moses. And he talks about what he wants this man Moses to do. You've been in Egypt. I want you to go back down to Egypt. I want you to deliver this people from Egyptian bondage. He does that. First few chapters of Exodus tells us all about that. How God protects for those people and he provides for them in the wilderness. He leads them all the way to Mount Sinai. And he powerfully reminds them of what has gone on. We can open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 19 where he recaps everything that has happened so far. Listen, you, you couldn't free yourselves from Egypt and you couldn't find food. You didn't have water, but I protected you and I provided for you. And here I have brought you to this great mountain. And what's he offering these people? He's offering a covenant, a relationship based on promises let's read beginning in exodus chapter 19 and verse 3 this is god to moses he says thus you shall say to the house of jacob and tell the people of israel we would call them descendants of abraham right recipients or benefactors of that covenant made to abraham you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, that's what I expect of you, then you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. That's what you can expect of me. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is how I want you to live. And this is what you can expect of me. These are my commandments. These are my expectations. These are my promises to you. It's the essence of a covenant. So Moses came and he called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We like the terms of this covenant. We're willing to enter into that covenant. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The people agree. They like the idea of the promises. God gives them a law. Now, how well do they do with that law? First of all, as far as God is concerned, does God let those people down? No. He continues to be faithful to them, right? How do the people do? Not well. Not well at all. Let's open our Bibles very quickly to Isaiah chapter 55 in the Old Testament. From that point forward, big picture of the Bible wise, from the book of Exodus throughout Malachi, this is all about God and the descendants of Abraham. How they did. Not well. They uh, go into that land eventually. Joshua leads them in. They, they don't conquer all of the territory that they should. They don't heed the warnings. And so eventually God disciplines them and they cry out to God. And so he'll raise judges up that deliver them for a while and, and that works all the way until the days of Samuel and eventually the people say all the other nations around us have a king we would like to have a king despite what God has told them and so God says okay this is what you can expect with a king but you've asked for it and I'll give it to you and so we've got this long line of kings a few of which stand out as great godly men of integrity, the majority of which are 
sorry leaders of God's people. And so over and over again, God is disciplining them, trying to get their attention. He, he raises up the, the empire of Babylon and uses them to discipline these people. In Isaiah chapter 55, right in the middle of that context, we find God's people are wicked, but God hasn't given up on His promise. Okay? Because there is a point to this covenant that's much bigger than just these people. Okay? In Isaiah chapter 55, we pick up in verse 1, Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money. This is God speaking. Come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Okay? Because of Abraham, because of David, and above all, because there is a plan slowly being worked out here, God doesn't give up. He continues to appeal to his people. He, he continues to look for a, a faithful remnant through which he can work. Because what's the ultimate point here? Is the nation of Israel the ultimate point of all of this? No. Is the lamb that they're living in the ultimate point? No. What is the ultimate point of this covenant? It's going to be available to everybody. Yeah? Maybe a better way of asking that. Who is the ultimate point of this covenant? Christ. Jesus is the ultimate point of this covenant. It is Jesus that God is going to raise up from very humble beginnings through this lineage. Okay, the covenant of never destroying the earth with water anymore, that, that's for all of humanity. These things have to do with Jesus. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to pause and like a DVD or a Blu-ray, we're, we're going to jump like 10 chapters ahead and then we're going to fill the middle in in just a minute. Let's open our Bibles very quickly to Romans chapter 7. Something very, very important happens in the New Testament. The, the third of the three thirds, or, or the, the, the second half of the Bible, first two thirds of the Bible is all the Old Testament, right? Last third is the New Testament. And in passages like Romans chapter 7, we run across very, very significant language, okay? We, we can't take the time to begin uh, the, the whole context, but look at verse 4, for instance, where the Apostle Paul says, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead. Now, all on its own, that sounds important, but maybe, maybe it's still a little cloudy. Something has happened, okay? And Paul is looking back. Paul is over here. He's looking back at Jesus and telling these Christians, these people who claim to be of Christ. I'm not sure what happened there. There we go. Um, uh, these people who claim to be of Christ, he's saying, you died to the law so that you can belong to another the idea of a covenant, right? You belong to someone else. To this one who was raised from the dead. Let's go back in uh, 2 Corinthians, two, two books over in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, we don't have time to read the whole context. That's why we give you all of this expansive material uh, ahead of time. But look at 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. He speaks of God who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. Talking about the apostles, these men who have been commissioned by Jesus, 
He has made us ministers of a new covenant. Something different from Abraham and Moses. A few pages over in Galatians chapter 3. Again, we're just getting a sampling of some of the significant things that Paul says, but we're just making this foundational point. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, talking about the law. What purpose did that law delivered through Moses, what purpose did that serve? Galatians 3 and verse 24, it was our guardian or our schoolmaster or our tutor until Christ came or to bring us to Christ. You see what Paul is doing? He's saying, no, 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 no. If you're looking as if this goes all the way to you and and you're under that covenant, you're mistaken. Because something very significant happened with Jesus. Those things served their purpose And they led us to Christ. They were guardians or tutors or or schoolmasters that led us to Christ. But now there's something different. Now it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Now it doesn't matter whether you're a man or or a woman as as far as the opportunity of, of being an heir of God. Now it doesn't matter what your family tree looks like. I'm writing to you over here on this side of the cross, Paul says in Romans and in 2 Corinthians and Galatians and in in talking with people on this side of the cross who who don't yet grasp it. He says in Galatians 3.24 that law was our tutor or our schoolmaster or our guardian to lead us to Christ. It was in effect until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come we are no longer under a guardian next book of the bible ephesians chapter 2 one more instance before we switch gears a little here ephesians chapter 2 same kind of thing ephesians 2 in the 12th verse of the chapter he reminds these gentiles people down here somewhere okay who are not members of that nation of israel they are not physical descendants of abraham and he says i want you to understand something about yourselves so that you understand the the nature of the good news remember that you were at that time separated from christ you were alienated from the commonwealth of israel you were strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near how did that happen by the blood of Christ down in verse 15 the goal that God would be able to take Jew and Gentile and create one new man We call those Christians, right? Doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you're in Christ, of Christ, you are a Christian. One new man in place of the two. Very quickly, let's go to the book of Hebrews that establishes this point very, very, very quickly or very clearly. In the book of Hebrews, it's the clearest, most authoritative expose on this big shift okay and that makes sense because who's the book of hebrews written to hebrews right people who were a part of that old law of moses that old covenant enacted uh, to or for the descendants of abraham key word in the book of hebrews is what there's one word over and over and over again in hebrews better better key word in the book of Hebrews okay here we are historically in the book of Hebrews and if we had time we could look in more detail Hebrews chapter 1 is all about Jesus is a better messenger you can stack up all the fathers all the prophets even all the angels and Jesus is a better messenger Hebrews chapter 3 he is our apostle and high priest and as such he's better than Moses chapter 4 he provides a better rest than Joshua provided. 
Chapters 5, 6, and 7, he's a better priest than those Old Testament Levites were. And then we come to Hebrews chapter 8. Here's what, where we want to camp for the next five minutes before we close. Based on that better foundation of Hebrews 1 through 7, Hebrews 8 tells us why there is a better covenant. The covenant of Jesus Christ that is available to all now, Jew or Gentile, this is better. And the Hebrew writer says, let me tell you why. Uh, in, in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 8, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, this is what I'm talking about, but this is not like that. It is new and it is better. Why? Well, for one, they did not continue in my covenant. And so I show no concern for them, declares the Lord. Paul develops in Romans chapter 7. God was not at fault here. The law was not at fault here. The people were at fault. They failed to keep the covenant they agreed to at Mount Sinai. And so what was the purpose of all of that? It was designed by God to lead us to Christ. A new minister of a new covenant. Now, our question is, it looks like in what we have as Hebrews chapter 8, that writer's quoting something. I mean, he's got a lot of original material, but he does a lot of quoting in Hebrews chapter 8. And where did he get that? That is from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31 is what the Hebrew writer is quoting in Hebrews chapter 8. And he wants to show us, I didn't come up with this radical idea on my own. This is not fresh thinking from me. I want you to know all the way back, more than 600 years before Jesus was ever born, God told you this was going to happen. In Jeremiah chapter 31, very, very quickly, let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah 31 and the 31st verse of the chapter in the Old Testament, God, using Jeremiah, his inspired spokesman, delivers these words. 600 years before Jesus, he says this in Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, verse 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one of them teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is going to be better. Why? Because over here, you're born into the covenant, right? Right? As a descendant of Abraham, you are born. No choice, no recognition, no awareness. You're born into it. Over here, all who are in this covenant shall know me. How? Well, they were taught, right? In the New Testament, people aren't born physically into this. They hear the gospel and they come to know and love and obey God. Over here, they were circumcised physically, males as a sign. Over here, Paul talks about how circumcision is of the heart. Because over here, I can bear that physical sign, but my heart be a million miles away from God. Over here, this is better. If there is circumcision, cutting away of the sin and the selfishness in the heart, that's better. Over here, you're born into the covenant, and as you grow, you're taught later. Over here, no, 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 no. Everybody in this covenant, under this New Testament system, the law is in their minds and on their hearts. Who puts it there? God puts it there. How does he put it there? 
we're holding it in our hands. This is better. Okay? Our foundational, foundational point for this morning. God is a God of covenants. And there are all sorts of covenants in the Bible. But this new covenant of Jesus Christ is even better. When did it come into effect? When do last wills and testaments come into effect? At death, right? Jesus did all sorts of things before. Even right there at, at the very, very end, He forgave that thief on the cross. And, you know, He's a popular guy to talk about. But that doesn't have any bearing on what God expects of you and me because He's over on that side, right? On this side of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, the gospel is in effect. The New Testament of Jesus Christ, okay? And we'll build on that, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. If you did not get lesson number four material, uh, for lesson number four, it's available on that pew in the back and on the visitor's table in the foyer. Thank you for being here.